Hello! Today I'm taking a brief detour from my Final Fantasy VII character discussions to briefly discuss the demo that recently dropped by Square, which features the opening gameplay of the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Now, for full disclosure, I'm not exactly in the vanguard of fans who are attuned to the daily updates and rumours on the remake, and much like my approach to going to the movies, I'm not actively looking at footage or leaks or even trailers um, unless someone's really recommended it to me because I do want to maintain a sense of anticipation and surprise uh, when I do finally, you know, experience it for myself. But having woken up Monday morning to a message from my childhood Final Fantasy friend telling me that a demo of the opening gameplay has dropped, which I wasn't aware of at all, uh, and then I arrived at work to an email from a colleague telling me to, you know, download this demo gameplay that's dropped, I, I just figured why not? You know, it's only the opening mission. Um, And everyone I know who plays games anyway is going to be talking about this, so I might as well check it out. Uh, And this short episode is basically a a short response to that, because actually it's a really interesting demo, as the first tangible glimpse of what the game experience to come will be. And in many ways, having played the demo, we can already see the consistencies with the original story, and also the subtle beginnings of the departures that will be coming down the line from the story as well. Uh, For those listening that haven't played the demo and don't want any narrative spoilers, um, I would say that there's not too much to spoil uh, if you've played the original title because it doesn't depart hugely from that. But there are some small differences I'll be discussing um, from here on in that will likely have implications on the story later, so you might not want to be around for that. So, Kicking off, uh, and just to quickly set the scene, because I think Final Fantasy appreciation is largely contextual and generational, and I am someone who discovered the Final Fantasy series with Final Fantasy VII uh, when I was about nine or ten years old, so I do have a particular relationship to it as my first JRPG, as I'm sure many do, and I was actually a pretty dumb kid, uh, and I'm mildly ashamed to admit that I got stuck on the Scorpion boss in this opening mission. So I loaned the game out to my aforementioned childhood friend, and that's how we both mutually discovered Final Fantasy. And we basically did that thing where you go around one another's houses with your memory cards and you're sort of playing through the story together, uh, which was great. But my point here is, you know, I'm not the fully old school Final Fantasy fan who was around for the Knights and Mages stuff of the early 90s. Nor was I a latter-day fan who was introduced and familiar with, uh, you know, voice acting, such as in Final Fantasy X. But, like many, I was ushered into the series at the beginning of what many consider to be, you know, this golden age, uh, as it's called, which was the fifth generation console cycle uh, and the trilogy of Final Fantasies that were released for the PlayStation 1. And, you know, these do remain among my favourite games to this day. So... With this in mind, and turning to the Final Fantasy VII Remake, it's a very interesting endeavour by Square, uh, and the general mood among the longer-term Final Fantasy fans seems to be quite divisive, uh, but leaning towards enthusiasm. Uh, And two comments I've received recently sort of crystallise this divisive sentiment, because on the one hand, you you have someone saying you shouldn't mess with people's nostalgia, which is a fair comment, And another one I got more recently states that it's a new game, it's an entirely new experience, and it should be considered as such. And the original title is always going to exist, uh, so, you know, you can play that and enjoy that, you know, if if you want to. So, for my part, I appreciate both sentiments, and personally, I am erring towards the latter idea. And from what I've seen of the remake so far, it reminds me a lot of what happened with the Harry Potter franchise, which much like Final Fantasy, I discovered as a child, um, and I loved the books, and I grew up with the books. And then the movies came out, and they sort of took the books uh, and transformed them into something familiar, but in many ways something entirely different as well, but still equally enjoyable. And I think this is the best way to view and appreciate the Final Fantasy VII Remake, where it's been taken from its 1997 origins and uniquely modernised and, and refitted for a modern audience, you know, a a modern platform, and I guess a a modern world, if you like. And really, my only lingering concerns about the game are, A, 
whether they're going to completely rinse it with DLC content um, that might obstruct the world and story, and B, whether it's actually going to be released in my lifetime, which I say only half-jokingly. But anyway, uh, digressions aside, let's jump into the demo now, and kicking off, I think one of the major concerns about the remake for many was the idea that Square is simply utilising nostalgia and their flagship title uh, as a cash grab. And indeed, the number of tech demos and references to Cloud jumping off that train dates back to the you know, the PlayStation 3 release, I think, and it's been consistently teased and alluded to for years, you know, along with, of course, the extended universe material, or the Final Fantasy VII compilation, as it's called, which augments the Final Fantasy VII story, but has, you know, some people quite cynically accusing it of being, you know, money spinning uh, on the part of Square. So, having played the demo, I am, at this point, pretty convinced that this game is far from being a cash grab or an attempt to boost share price by Square. It feels very considered and laboured upon to retain the essence of the original game, yet augmented in several key ways to refresh the experience. And I'm not just talking about graphics, uh, because of course it is a very beautiful looking game, as I'm sure you've seen. So what I mean by retaining and augmenting the experience is, for example, idle dialogue that occurs while you're running around that hints at the existential dilemma to come later, And they don't make it too blatant or dine out on it, or assume that you're already aware of the story. And for example, uh, Barrett asks Cloud how old he is, and Cloud responds confusedly that he's soldier first class. And Barrett then says, no, I mean, what's your age? And Cloud sort of stutters off into silence. And in similar fashion, we have Jesse asking Cloud how he knows Tifa, and the screen fuzzes slightly to indicate that he can't quite recall. So little bits like this are interesting hints towards Cloud's story arc, and they begin shaping his character development without being excessive or departing too much from the original title. And in similar fashion, we have Jessie's throwaway comments that hint that she's kind of interested in Cloud, and we have Wedge being quite obviously enamoured by how cool Cloud is, which retains faithfulness to the original, but is pleasantly repackaged Um, in this current generation format. In keeping with this, and much more impressively, we have the environment of the Midgar reactor, which has maintained its style and layout from the original game, to the extent that you can actually identify the rooms that you're in from the 1997 title, which for some reason really impressed me. And basically, in short, if you've looked at the trailers and the footage available, um, and you've assumed that this demo is basically just a really glitzy, stylized version of the opening 30 minutes of the original game, you're not far off. Uh, And personally, I think the departures will become much more evident, you know, basically immediately after this demo takes place, which is when we reconvene with Tifa, um, when we meet Eris, for example. And we basically, I assume, will witness Midgar becoming a much more expansive open world experience. Because I think it's here... Uh, that they're going to introduce the sprawling subplots and the side quests across the city and also start exploring how these characters interact and react to this early, quite muddled version of Cloud. Now, turning to the differences, one thing I noted immediately was the opening cutscene of Eris in the alleyway and how in the original game she stands up and strides out towards the camera, which then zooms out over Midgar. In the remake, we have a similar set piece but Eris is actually sensing something menacing in the alleyway, and then she flees out onto the streets of Midgar. And this is interspersed with the opening soundtrack, but over the top of this, and quite different from the original, we hear the quiet melody of One Winged Angel playing. So there's a definite amalgamation of story at work here, which, based on the music, I assume is regarding Sephiroth, um, and perhaps the Genova reunion, that right from this opening moment draws Eris into what is traditionally Cloud's story. And I think an easy assumption to make could be that maybe Sephiroth is aware that she's in possession of the white materia, which is the only thing that could potentially stop his plans, you know, of summoning Meteor with the black materia. So that's just an early stab in the dark about why that could be. And perhaps it's a logical, albeit revisionist angle for where this story is going to go and that Sephiroth is maybe hunting Eris, where he wasn't in the original game. 
once the train draws into Midgar, Barrett calls up to Cloud something like, get down here, Merc, which replaces the immortal, uh, come on, newcomer, follow me. Um, and then we're immediately introduced to the game mechanics, which, as you might imagine, is kind of Kingdom Hearts meets Final Fantasy XV by default. But there is an option to switch to classic turn-based gameplay, and having tried both, I can say that the standard gameplay is definitely much more nimble-fingered, action-centric, borderline chaotic, but it is enjoyable, although I personally found it enjoyable. And the classic gameplay is, of course, a much more turn-based JRPG thing that caters to traditionalists of the title. Now, I mentioned in my recent Cloud Strife discussion that I'd be interested to see how they handle the whole this is more than just a reactor scenario in the remake, because there's a lot of questions around whether this voice is Zack, Sephiroth, or the real Cloud, and I suggested that they could retcon or remove this entirely, and what they've done, uh, in the demo at least, is partially retain it. And what they did was they showed Cloud freaking out when it's time to set the bomb, which he does in the original, but instead of a voice, we see a solitary black feather float down beside him, which indicates, of course, the one-winged angel, Sephiroth. So this leans towards the reunion story arc, and that Sephiroth is actively haunting him from the outset, which many have suggested in the past. And it's prudent to mention that the demo does actually conclude with a brief vision of Sephiroth flashing up as well, which further emphasises this idea that Sephiroth is going to be connected to Cloud much more earlier in the game uh, than in the original title. So, moving on, another interesting departure which actually alters the story slightly is seeing cuts to Heidegger and President Shinra, who are watching events unfold during the bombing mission. And as their villainy is crafted here with a subtle retcon, because in this version of the game, the avalanche bomb fails to detonate, or fails to fully detonate, um, after we defeat the Scorpion boss. And so President Shinra directs Heidegger to detonate the reactor themselves um, with their own robo-guards, which, much like the destruction of the plate that occurs in the original game, shows the willingness of Shinra to orchestrate self-sabotage attacks um, and injure innocent people, uh, you know, to turn public opinion against Avalanche. And it will be interesting to see how that might develop in the in the full remake. Now, another, not so much difference, but a definite revelation that occurs in the remake is the pronunciation of Mako, which, as it turns out, is pronounced Mako. And I'm open to opinion on this because I'm aware that I have a pretty heinous record of pronouncing names in Final Fantasy. And every few months, someone will comment to me that my pronunciation of Eris or Aerith is wrong, because I've always said Ares, and my pronunciation of Rinoa um, as Rhinoa is also very wrong. And uh, by the way, I messaged my friend to ask how he pronounces the former, um, and he pronounced it Ares too. And I'm going to put that message on the screen just to show that I'm not the only one who has made this mistake in the past. But anyway, I'm interested to know if any phono aesthetic enthusiasts out there have ever anticipated that it was called Mako as opposed to Mako, because that's something that I really never considered before either. Uh, so anyway, I mean, really, that's the extent of the major differences that we witness in the demo. I, I've probably missed a couple. Um, you know, there's definite more, definitely more action-based gameplay, as you might expect, with a brief dodge the lasers sequence. Um, there's much more instantaneous combat. Um, and there's much more incidental dialogue that helps character development, um, particularly among tertiary inclusions, such as Biggs, Wedge and Jesse. But generally, I think it's pretty similar to the original opening of the game. But interestingly, where I've previously mentioned um, that the beginnings of Final Fantasy games generally allow players to run through and attack, 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 and basically not even really need to use a potion, um, Final Fantasy VII, at least on the normal setting, is a fair bit more challenging, um, particularly the Scorpion Guard, which has several stages to defeating it. And I was quite pleased that my friend messaged me on Monday evening saying that the Guard Scorpion game overed him on his first attempt, because he spent over two decades laughing at me for getting beaten by this thing as a kid. Anyway, um, final quick points before I wrap up. Uh, initial characterization is quite interesting, particularly around Cloud and Barrett. 
And regarding Barrett, he has proved slightly controversial in the past because some consider him to fall back on this racial stereotyping, which on the one hand I can see where that argument comes from, but I'd agree with it more if Barrett were simply this two-dimensional typecast character all the way through the story who has no rhyme or reason to his demeanour. But as it stands, um, and as I've discussed in the past, Barrett is actually one of the more interesting three-dimensional characters, in my opinion, and he has this anger and indignation rooted in regrets and a tragic backstory, which his backstory at Corel and the Gold Saucer um, explores. And I think it perfectly rationalises why he is the way he is at the beginning of the game. And on this note, the remake does hint at this self-conflict and his grappling with self-control, because in the elevator, while we're escaping from the the reactor, he's going crazy about Shinra and stuff, and Cloud sort of quietly gestures at him, um, and then we see Barrett's clenched fist sort of loosen up, and he has this brief introspective moment, which was really kind of subtle, but also very interesting, and this gives me hope that Barrett will get even more development and more backstory exploration um, in the full remake, which would be, you know, great, I think, because the sequence at Corel, um, Dine, all of that stuff, I thought was really emotive uh, in the original title. And as I discussed previously in my Dine episode, I would really have enjoyed exploring that story a little bit more. You know, to conclude, having said that, if you're among those who wasn't really keen on Barrett um, in the original for whatever reason then don't expect much revisionism in the remake so far, because he's still a very ballsy, loud leader with um, bad language uh, and stuff like that. And yeah, he is pretty consistent with the 1997 release. Moving on to Cloud, I don't have too much to say on him, to be honest. Uh, The look and feel with him in-game and the controls and the movement is great. Um, And as I say, it's not a million miles away from Final Fantasy XV controls. Uh, But the proportions and the handling of the Buster Sword is actually pretty good, despite the historic ridiculousness of its size. But they really nailed the gameplay visuals and the visual ergonomics of Cloud handling the sword, um, which looks really cool. As I've stated, uh, they begin hinting at this crisis of self, um, and actually, despite the voice acting and this ability of current-gen consoles to communicate much more, you know, emotions through you know, facial expressions and whatnot. In my opinion, they have maintained Cloud's stoic, blank slate demeanour pretty well in the beginning of the game. But also, more importantly, um, and again, as I stated in my recent Cloud discussion, I really hoped that they would maintain this comedic edge and periodic goofiness of his character that they had in the original title. And actually, in the demo, we see him having these infrequent combative bantering discussions with Barrett, which hints at this penchant for humour. And I think it looks like that that's going to be maintained, which is great. Uh, But again, you know, it's only 30, 40 minutes of gameplay in this demo, so it's quite hard to really tell. And I guess we should manage expectations for the full scope of the character development and story. So that about wraps up my thoughts on the demo and the remake so far. I think the main thing we can take from the demo is the new style of gameplay and, of course, the graphics, because, as I've said, the implications for story, it's still way too early to tell where that's going to go. And, as I've said, the bombing mission is actually pretty similar to the original. Uh, But nonetheless, you know, it did impress me. And I mentioned I'd been uh, reconnecting with my friend over this. Um, And, as I've said, we're childhood friends. We live in different cities these days and we only talk every couple of months or so. But now we've been messaging daily uh, and it really conjures up these memories of talking about game progress in the school playground. And now it's 20 years later and we're doing the same thing with our demo playthrough and also the fact that we're both replaying the 1997 release. And I suppose this indicates both the nostalgia factor of video games and how powerful and, and delicate that can be. And going back to that earlier comment I noted, you know, it's a very dangerous territory to, to mess with that and someone's feelings about a game. So it is interesting to see how how the eventual turnout will be. And just to wrap up, and perhaps interestingly, you know, to come out of these discussions with my friend, we've discussed what they might include or add or remove. And what it's interesting to leave off on, uh, just before we get the full release of the game, is where this first segment of the release is going to end. 
um, you know, for my part, it seems logical to be exiting the plains of Midgar, you know, heading off in the sunset towards the village of Kham. And, you know, I think this game is just going to be confined to Midgar. But owing to the fact that this mere 40 minute demo was almost eight gigabytes of hard drive space, you know, who can really say? And I think it's interesting to see where that cutoff point of the Midgar game might be. So there we have it. If you got this far, thanks very much for listening. Uh, kudos to you. And drop a comment. Let me know your thoughts on the demo.